All right. Hello, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about the brain and vision, how the brain converts light to perception. Um, so I would like to make my lecture as interactive as, as possible, and then I want to keep it casual. All righty. So um, my research interests are in visual perception and in auditory perception, time perception, pretty much all about perception, right? How we um, process our external world and then build our internal experience. And then I do build some statistical models, I do behavioral measures and brain imaging and the brain stimulation. Um, who takes my classes in the University of Tokyo? It's actually pretty much anyone. Um, so we do have a little complicated um, the department system, but basically for the freshman sophomore year, we have this human science division and the natural science division. And then there is a program in English at Komaba. Pretty much anyone uh, can take my psychology class and then go into brain sciences class. That's probably uh, why I was asked to give this lecture to you guys, because there is no prerequisite to understand my lecture. So today, I want to what I want to talk is this, how lights are converted to neural activities and how we perceive colors, how we perceive edges of an object. So I will only talk about the vision, but all those sensory perception is a process of converting external information into neural activities. And then we interpret those neural activities as our perceptual experience. You know, for example, the auditory perception, the sound is the, a wave traveling through the air. We somehow convert this wave traveling, traveling through the air into neural activities by using our ears, right? And then taste is like converting the molecules contained in the food into neural activities. So by learning the case of visual perception, I hope you guys will see the wonderful world of perception in general that we experience every day. All righty, now I would like to start with this question. What is color? Um, please write down anything that pops up to your mind. There is no correct answer. Whatever you think what color is, just please write it down. And then let's see how people define color. No Googling, no cheating, just anything that you can think of, please write that down. Mm, very nice. So I am seeing um, wavelength, light with a certain frequency, visible spectrum, neurological perception, combination of light and darkness. Very, very nice. Reflection of light that our brains perceive to be in different shades. Okay, thank you very much. So that is my first question that I will share the answers uh, to you guys later. Okay, let me ask you a second question. Explain your perception of the color red. That's, I'm opening up the next poll. Explain your perception of, your perception of red. Just do not say it's like the color of the traffic light sign. That's not your perception. That's just the, you know, object that has the color of red. That's not the question. Okay, but so mm, interesting. Learn what red is by others. Love. <laughs> okay, brave. Wow. Thank you. Um, I just saw the answer. Someone wrote down that it's hard to explain, right? That's exactly my point. It is probably impossible to explain um, the perception of red, but I will come back to this point later. All right. So someone wrote that uh, when I asked what is color, someone wrote that it's the, it's the spectrum. That's partially bright. So, so this is the spectrum of, of electromagnetic energy and the visible spectrum. So in our environment, we have wide range of um, electromagnetic energy. And then, then what we are able to see is just a tiny bit of, the, of that part. So it's about 400 nanometer to the 700 nanometer. That is the visible light for us, right? Um, 
so we call this the visible spectrum that's about 400 to 700 nanometer, but it is visible only um, for our eyes, for the humans. So different animals have different visible spectrum. For example, butterflies can see the ultraviolet light, but people cannot see. But anyway, so this is what we are seeing. That's a spectrum. So now let's talk about the perception, what happens when the light comes into our eyes. So that's the entryway of the visual perception, right? So here is the cross section of an eye. So eye is covered with a really strong white material called the scrella. And then in front, that part is totally transparent that we call that cornea. And then when the light comes into our eyes, it is the, the refracted by the, this lens. And then the image is projected onto the retina, okay? And then after the information is processed by the eye, that, will, that information will travel through um, this the optic nerve and then the information is sent to all the way to the back of the head that is the visual cortex so today i will mostly talk about this the retina and eye and then we'll probably talk a little bit about the visual cortex but anyway let's go back to the retina so here is a question how are lights converted to neural activities to understand that um, so uh, we need to understand the retina, right? That's the, that's the part, that's the layers of the, new, the cells that are lined at the very uh, back of the eye. And then the first step that converts light into the neural activities is this, uh, these guys that are colored in blue and then green in these drawings, um, which is called the photoreceptors, okay? So this, this is, these photoreceptors are responsible to convert lights into the neural activities. But then um, before going into the details, I wanna just um, again ask you questions. So obviously this is a super simplified drawings, um, drawing of our eye. What do you think the color of this retina? If if there is any color of the retina, what color would that be? And then what do you think is inside of this eyeball? It should be filled with what? Air, water, some sort of, I don't know, sticky stuff, anything? So please write that down in on slide two. And I next slide, I am going to show you a movie of a uh, pig eye dissection that I conducted in my living room. Um, so it is it is so a little bit graphic. So if you do not want to see it, uh, you may close your eyes. I will I will you know tell you when we are done. So only if you want to see it, um, you can uh, see the movies with us. Okay, someone wrote that. Uh, it should be some transparent fluid, okay? And then someone said, it must be yellow-like, maybe. Why do you think it's yellow-like? <laughs> okay, and then someone said, retina should be red, and then inside with the eyeball should be transparent. Very nice. All right, let's see how it's like. Here is the movie. Okay, so I am going to cut this eye with this oh this is uh, this is a pig eye that I obtained from um, some pr processing plant okay so back of the eye there's a this little cute thing sticking out this is the the fiber that's coming through um, coming out of the the retina optic nerve that's very cute right and then I'm going to fast forward and you see the scrilla is super strong. I tried to spear it with this needle, but it won't break. That's how strong it is. Now I'm going to fast forward. And then, 
what's inside of this eyeball is like this. Maybe I should fast forward a little bit more. Okay, so that is totally transparent, jello-ish material. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah? Okay. Then if I look the, the front of the eye from inside, it looks like this. The lens is also totally transparent. That makes sense, right? We need to um, take the light from outside of the world and then project it, that information onto the retina. So uh, yeah, we need to have this transparent part. And yes, thank you for commenting that. And then someone said, it's wow, it's black, right? The inside of the eye is totally black. Yes, so that's all the way Along, around that the eyeball, it's, it's, it's a black pigment. And then I'm going to fast forward. And then in the end, I take out the lens and then lens is actually working, functioning as a lens. All right, so that's about it. You, you may open your, you can open your eyes. Now the movie is over. So the answer is the inside of the eye, it's totally transparent material. And then the back of the, uh, the all around, it's like the filled with the black pigment, but actually the retina itself is transparent. So the color we just saw, oops, was the color of this, the pigment epithelium. So that was the pigment at the, of the black we saw. And then the, the that these new cells on retina are all transparent. So the first step that, that as, I, as I said, the converting light into the neural activities uh, uh, is the work done by these photoreceptors. There are two types. The rod works in the night vision when it's dark and then it works to detect lights and then it doesn't see colors. But calm, on the other hand, uh, it has a really high visual acuity. It can see the details and then it, it can see colors and then it works in the daytime. It's when it's like lots of light. All right, so how do we perceive colors? I asked you guys a question, what is color? So this is related to that question. So most of the light we see is reflected light. And then um, reflected light of the light sources. So typical light source, for example, the sunlight contains a wide range of electromagnetic spectrum. So not only our visible spectrum, but it's in, it goes above and beyond that visible spectrum. So that light source will um, shed lights onto an object. In this case, I put an apple in front of the sunlight. And then this, the surface of the apple absorbs the shorter wavelengths and then reflect the longer wavelength. So it observes this blue-ish to the yellow, green, sorry, blue to green spectrum, it observes. And then it reflect that the red wavelength. As a result, we see red apple in front of us, right? If our light source is not the sunlight, if our light source only contains the shorter to the middle spectrum, what happens would be that the all the lights uh, projected onto this apple will be absorbed by the surface. There is, therefore, there will be not much refraction. Then what we'll see is just a grayish apple in front of us. So in a sense, the color we perceive is not a property of the object in front of us. It's a property, oh, it's a combination of the light source and then the, the uh, and the characteristics of the, the object and the surface of the object. And then also our perception, right? So it's very much complicated stuff. All right, now, why uh, let me talk about how those cones work. As, as I said, cones um, can see colors, can tell the color differences because we have three types of cones. Some of uh, you guys might have um, Run this in uh, partially in the school, uh, the high school biology. 
but S cone has a peak sensitivity to the short wavelength around blue, and then M cone has a peak sensitivity to the medium wavelength about green, and then L cone has a sensitivity to the long wavelength around yellow to red. So by using these three cones, we are able to see the colors, right? Why we need three? So this is explanation. Let's say if you only have one type of cone, one type of photoreceptor, what happens is that if the output, output of that photoreceptor is 50% of the maximum, it could be because it perceived blue or it could be it perceived orange, right? Because it, it, the orange and the blue would give the same amount of response. We won't, this system cannot tell the difference between the blue and an orange. But it, in reality, most of us do have three types of cones. So the blue will give you the nearly 100% response for the S cone, and then this 50% of the M cone, and then 40% of the L cone out, output. And then on the other hand, orange gives 0% response for the S cone, and then like 50-ish for the M, and then 70-ish for the L. So by using this combination of cones, we are able to have this the rich experience of colors. All right. So um, I need to note that uh, there are some individuals who are missing one or more of their cone systems. And then some textbook says this uh, colorblind, but I prefer to use the term color deficiency or the perceptual viability. Um, actually, the about 8% males and then 0.4% females are estimated to have that color deficiency. And that's because that, uh, the gender difference here is that the many of the genes for the color vision are on the X chromosome. So therefore men are more likely to be the color deficient. Um, I used a little simulator, shim simulation software uh, to show how it would be like to, um, how it we like uh, to see uh, these images. So the original is the one that I took uh, when I traveled to Hokkaido a couple of years back. That's a beautiful picture with lots of colors. Uh, if you have three cones, you will see the colorful images here. And then, but if you are L cone, the long, the, the, the red cone is deficient, then you will see sort of to my eyes, it looks like a yellowish um, image. And then if you are M cone deficient, that green deficient, you see the, a bit of a different, different colors. And if you are S cone deficient, the whole image will like a little bit of red-ish. So each of us do have a little bit slightly different response characteristics. So this L and M and S cone, and then some of you may have this color deficiency. So that gives us a variability in our perception of color. So let me go back to my original question. I asked, explain your perception of red. So 24 of you, uh, thank you, gave me um, the comments. Yep, it's <laughs> warm, luck, Chinese New Year, I like it, angry, love, bravery. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's super subjective, right? So that is exactly the nature of color perception. I cannot emphasize enough that it is almost impossible to tell uh, my perception of red um, is whether or not the same as your perception of red. In fact, it, we might be able to, we might be actually looking at the same thing, but thinking it's like you know, experiencing the totally different color. So that's actually the one of the reasons I find this the study researches on perception is so fascinating that it's it's so hard because uh, it's all inside of our experience, but somehow we wanna we have to do research on it. It's, that's super exciting, and so no, this perceptual via variability is not only for the the color deficient example, but also we can demonstrate that with this super famous case of the dress, right? You, many of you probably have seen this picture before, but let me um, ask this 
to you guys anyway. So my question is, what do you think the color of this dress? Some people think this is blue and black, and then some other people think this is white and gold. What do you see? Please write that on Slido. Okay, blue with brown, blue and black. Well, so many people see blue and black, white, yellow. Yep, thank you. White and gold. Yes, thank you very much. So we are obviously looking at the same picture, but some people think this dress is blue and black, and then other people think this dress is white and gold. By the way, I can only see white and gold. I cannot, I cannot believe some people see blue and black on this um, dress. So that's how diverse, uh, how variable our perception, our perceptions are. All right, so um, let's, me, let me move on to the next uh, topic. I will come back, I will come back to this the perceptual viability thing later on. So the next topic of, of today is that uh, is how we perceive edges, right? So that is uh, the these layer uh, this layer of neurons that's called the retinal ganglion cell is responsible for the detecting edges. So let me talk about these beautiful neurons. Okay, to understand that, I need to explain uh, you guys about the receptive field. So receptive field is a spatial location where some stimuli presented within that location can evoke a sensory neural stimulus. For example, I find, let's say I specify one retinal ganglion cell, and then I stick a measuring electrode to it. And then I present a light stimulus uh, on the computer screen. And then when subject is looking at this fixation point, and then when I present a stim stimulus here, this neuron responds, responds a lot, right? If I turn it off, and then I put the, another stimulus in another special location, in this case, this neuron doesn't respond much. So this is a exa uh, the example of the receptive field. For this particular neuron, um, this location, the circled with the solid black line, that's the receptive field. But the, the area circled by this dotted line is not the receptive field, right? So the retinal ganglion cell that I just introduced, that was actually the third ray layer of the retina, has really, really beautiful characteristics of this, the retinal, uh, the receptive field, which is, it, it has a receptive field of the circle shape. And then it has the inside circle and then the outside of the circle. When I put, so the for one retinal ganglion cell called on center cell, is that when I put the light at the center of the receptive field, that neuron respond a lot, right? But if I put the light in the surrounding area within that receptive field, that neuron is inhibited. So in a sense, this is on center part is on and then surrounding part is off. And then there's another type of retinal ganglion cell that has this, the, if I put the light inside, then the neuron is inhibited. But if I put the light in the outside, the neuron is starts to burst. Or if I put a small light in this, right in the center, it starts to you know, respond relatively well. And then I enlarge that spotlight and if the size of the spotlight is right um, amount of that the center field, then this neural response will be the maximum. If I enlarge that spotlight from there, then neuron gets inhibited again. So that is the that is how this retinal ganglion cell behaves. Let me go back here. All right. So that's the characteristics of this retinal ganglion cell. Okay, so why this is important? So this is important because at the only the third step in the retina, this neuron can detect the edge, the edge of this size of the spotlight. So that's how beautifully organized our retina is. 
Okay, let me um, show you a demonstration of that uh, receptive field. This is an illusion called the Hellman grid illusion. So this is just a you know, high contrast, the black squares aligned on a white background. But you will probably see uh, some dark gray shade right at the intersection of this white area, right? That, don't, that they don't exist there. The, the, all those intersection areas are all white, but regardless, we see like a little bit of the dark shade. That can be explained by this on-center, off-center receptive field. Um, so the neuron, the retinal ganglion cell that has a receptive field at this intersection, it has the on-center and an off-surround, but this neuron, activities of this neuron is inhibited more because we have light, bright light at the inhibitory surrounding area. But then the neurons that has the receptive field at this part, the lower part, then it it's not get inhibited as much because it, it, it only has like two minuses here, right? On the other hand, the above um, figure, we have four minuses. So above figure, it has more inhibition compared to the bottom one. So that is why more inhibition means less neural activities. There we see a shade, the darker perception. So why is this important? Functional role of off-center, on-center, a receptive field. A uniform field is everywhere in our visual world, but they are not important, right? You don't find the blank white wall that exciting. Um, in fact, edge detection is critical in many situations such as finding a predator or finding food or navigations. So basically like the all animals, including human, we need to detect edges. We don't care too much, so much about this totally uniform field. So this on-center, off-center receptive field on retina enables the simple edge detection in the very early stage of the visual processing. Demonstration for you guys. So as I said, so we have photoreceptors lining up at the back of the head that photoreceptors convert the light into the neural activities. Then those neural activities will be uh, passed to the retinal ganglion cell. There we have this beautiful organization of this the receptive field. So once the information is processed at the retinal ganglion cell, that those information is sent to the brain through the optic nerve. But then to do to send that information to the brain, um, those fibers will have to travel through the eye. So that was the tiny little cute part that was sticking out of the the, the eye. Uh, the, the eye that we, we just saw in the movie. Okay, so let's pay attention to this part that I put this, the, the arrow, that's called the optic disc. Because the fiber is traveling through the eyeball, we cannot have photoreceptors here at this particular location. And then because we, do not, we don't have photoreceptors here, we are not able to see anything at this retinal location. So let's do the demonstration. Okay, so this is how it works. Please close your right eye, open your left eye, and then with your left eye, look at the fixation point. Look at the cross mark here with your left eye. Close your right eye. And then, you know, gradually move your heads towards or against the screen. And then if you are at the right distance from the screen, the spot on the left should disappear. That is because this, the spot on the left is just fell onto your blind spot of your left eye. Okay, yes, it worked. Move, moving on to the next example. Let's do the same thing. Close your right eye and then look at the, fix, uh, look at the cross mark with your left eye. Now what happens when this, the gap I presented hit on your blind spot. So I assume that you will see this the prolonged continuous gray bar traveling through your blind spot, right? It became a solid line, thank you. Isn't that surprising? So this is actually, um, this is called a perceptual filling in. Um, 
So this means that higher areas of the visual processing, basically the brain, process that information. And then the brain knows that there are continuous gray bars around the blind spot. So the higher area of the visual processing stream put that information in that missing um, the blind spot. So that's how smart the visual, uh, the visual processing is. Um, in reality, the blind spot in the left eye is covered by the non-blind spot of the right eye and then blind spot on the right eye is covered by the left eye. So if you open up two eyes, we don't have to worry about the blind spot. But even if you close one of your eyes, you don't have the huge black hole in your vision, right? It's somehow filled in. And then you it's impossible to be aware of that blind spot unless you, you know, explicitly test that uh, perception. Um, I got the question, let's see. Can different people's brain fill in the blind spot differently? Actually, it's known that the, 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 this filling in is pretty consistent across people. So everyone will see the gray horizontal line here. Everyone will see just the white uniform area here. I would love to um, talk more about how amazing this higher visual processing uh, mechanism is, but we don't have time for that today. Um, so therefore, I only almost only talk about the retina. But let me uh, just a little bit talk about uh, the brain. So this is the, like I just talked about told about the talked about the receptive field of the retinal ganglion cell that was centered around the circle shape. But then after the retina, I said the information will go to the back of the head, that's the visual cortex. And then in this, if I stick the measuring electrode in the one neuron of the visual cortex, and then the measure the receptive field of one visual cortex neuron, it looks like this. Now it respond to the a bar that has a certain orientation. That's because the retinal ganglion cell to the next step, LGN, that I'm not going to talk today, to the V1, it has a projection like this. So basically, the comb combination of the retinal ganglion cells will enable the brain, the later processing in the brain, to detect one particular um, the bar that has the particular orientation. right? So step by step, um, the, okay. So the first step, light is converted into neural activities and the photoreceptors. There we had three types of scones, that, there we see colors. Now that the information is passed onto this retinal ganglion cell, even it's, it's not, it's not in the brain yet. It's still inside the eyeball, but even that neuron can detect the edge of a circle. That's if that's not amazing, what is? And then that information is combined later on in the brain. We are able to see the orientation of the bar. Okay, from there it gets more and more complicated. I I teach a whole semester just for this the visual processing. So obviously uh, it's impossible to cover everything, but I hope um, uh, through today's lecture, you guys get share, uh, probably understand why I am so passionate about this visual perception and then like why this um, attracts so many researchers all over the world this the beautiful organization of this perceptual uh, information processing. All right, so I think I should be taking questions, but I, um, I here I put some pictures that, that I took re recently in my lab. Uh, I, we <laughs> I force students to wear a mask and then face, face shield, and then we are doing tons of experiments still, like I stimulate people's brain and then I measure EEG electro electroencephalogram and then this is the MRI and then we do the MRI image analysis with undergraduate students. So basically what I'm going to say is that the, at least to me, the University of Tokyo, the Komobo campus is just a 
dream place to work to do the research on human neuroscience. So I hope you guys can um, come visit us sometime. All right, this is a summary of today's topic. Um, here, I think I have 10 minutes to take questions. So please feel free to ask questions, whatever that pops up to your mind. What's your educational background, both in neuroscience and psychology? Good question. I, I graduated um, from the University of Tokyo. I had a bachelor's degree in literature, actually. <laughs> um, but I really loved the, the classes, um, the courses of psychology. So that's my educational background. How did you get passionate about this topic? How could I not? <laughs> this is, uh, I don't know. Um, it's just the classes I took when I was an undergraduate student. I just, I, so I think many people do have similar experience at the different materials, but mainly here, this system, like the central surround receptive field is now the information is sent to this the next step in the brain. Now we see this the, the orientation of the bars. When I understand this mechanism, I got chills. <laughs> I was a one undergraduate student. So from there on, I decided to go to the graduate school and then I got my PhD in the in Massachusetts. All right. Um, uh, literature, uh, the, the, the literature student here too, yay! But with biology background before university, so this lecture made me really happy. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, some diseases can be spotted when taking pictures and in eyes reflection. I've heard yes, that is correct. If you take pictures um, at the, some clinical setting, you and then you can actually take pictures how blood vessels are tra uh, running at. at inside of your eyes and then like how your retina is nicely organized or you know being damaged a little bit all those things can be um, tested by by taking a picture of an eye oh here is a really nice question uh, i somewhere heard that very few people carry four different types of cones is it true you guys are so good Yes, that is true. I skipped today, but majority of people have, do have three types of cones. But I, I don't, I don't know exactly. But one in ten thousand ish could be wrong. A very, very few female person can have extra cone, and then that person is known to have be able to uh, discriminate more colors than others. And the other, any other questions? Okay. I still do not get it how the wave we receive can represent different colors. So the wave itself has color. Um, no, the wave, uh, so we do have these three types of cones, right? And then what we, what is projected to the retina is a particular wavelength. So if we receive this 625 nanometer, then our system is activated. So L cone is activated a lot and then M cone is activated reasonably well and then there's no activation of the S cone. This combination is interpreted in our perceptual uh, world as orange, but it, it is just it, what it is. And then it is extremely difficult. So that's, this is actually really um, philosophical question. As, so as I said, it is impossible to explain my perception, my experience of red to you guys, right? So that's because this is just the automatic interpretation of those LMS con activations. Um, is a cafe cafe wall illusion same explanation? No, cafe wall illusion is more. Uh, 
if you're interested, please um, Google Cafe Wall Illusion is another robust illusion that's about the orientation and the combination of black and white. But that's that's I believe that's has different explanation that has nothing to do with the, today's material. And let me try to see your explanation of what is color. So let's see how you guys brought. Uh, color is that we perceive when a white light is refract refracted. We see the opposite color due to the wavelength and frequency it is transmitted at. It's pretty nice. Okay, each one's perception of light. Mm. Okay. Wave of lights. Mm. <laughs> ha ha, I don't know. I, I like your honesty. <laughs> so to, after the, uh, listening through today's lecture, I hope you got some idea of what actually color is. And then let's move on to the, your, your uh, perception of red. Um, warm, strong color, warming, warm. <laughs> yep, I, I always love to ask this question to my students. Negativity, or maybe that's related to anger. One of the main message that I wanted to uh, share with you is that, uh, that as I said, the perception is to some degree, it's automatic, right? We see colors, we see objects, we pretty much automatically have our perceptual experience. But as we talked about this, the, with the example of the dress or this, the, the, uh, the perception of the, the variability in perception, it's different across people. And then, but somehow we kind of live a super comf comfortable life pretending that we are perceiving the same thing. That is totally an illusion, right? What I see um, is probably different of what you see and what I hear is different of what you hear. Oh, for example, I have a good example. So our lenses, the lenses get um, less clear. It get the lens deteriorate as you get older. So I assume um, many of you are younger than me. So I, the blue sky I look at is probably not as blue as the sky you look at. So you know our perceptual experience it's totally subjective, and then I hope. Um, um, and then, you know, only until recently, the researchers realized that importance of uh, doing research on that perceptual individual, uh, individual differences in those perceptual experience. So there are so many things that are, that needs to be studied. And then I am so excited that I have 20 more years to do that in the University of Tokyo.